So hello and welcome to our Zoom education session. Today on the topic of activities to do at home. And we really reached out to uh, many individuals when we first started doing these Zoom education sessions to determine what topics were of interest to hear about. And, and this was one of those resounding topics that we were hearing. You know, now with us um, being mostly at home, due to COVID-19, we're really looking for activities that we can do within the home because we're not getting out to enjoy those activities in other social settings. So that's what we're bringing you today. Uh, my name is Sarah Cook and I'm a public education coordinator at the Alzheimer Society of Peterborough, Kawartha Lakes, Northumberland and Halliburton. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, and my co-education coordinator, Shelby Berry, to be able to bring you this topic today. Shelby's waving hello. And we really hope that you enjoy this presentation and that you find it um, quite helpful. So I'm going to start, hold on one moment. I'm just gonna exit my screen just for a moment so that I can share this with you. And hopefully everybody can see that. Shelby, I can see you. Can you just nod if you can see the, the screen? We can see it, but it's in notes mode. Okay, I'm going to change it. I just wanted okay. to make sure that you can see it. All right. Okay, how are we doing there? Everybody can see it? Beautiful. Okay. So as I mentioned, the topic today is activities to do at home. And we're really gonna talk about tips and strategies for persons living with dementia and their caregivers. So we're gonna begin talking today about the importance of activity. And when you think about it, everything that we do in a day is really considered an activity. And each activity has a different purpose. Um, in our life and, and we may consider it to have a lot of importance or a lot of meaning and some activities we don't attribute the same uh, importance or meaning to. I often think about do, things like doing the dishes and, and a person may place a lot of importance on having a, a spotless kitchen where somebody else might say, I'm not so much about keeping my kitchen as clean as possible. I really enjoy being out in my garden. So it really can depend on, you know, how that interest or how that meaning um, can be placed on that particular activity. So when you think about it, we engage in activities all day and all night because even sleeping is considered an activity. Um, so you know, staying active and engaging the brain can be very, uh, very helpful. You know, staying engaged in those daily activities can help to keep our brains active and stimulated. Um, activities can, I think I've gone, oh, no. Um, activities can, you know, help with also the feelings of isolation that we may be experiencing, especially now while we're being asked to physically distance ourselves from others. Um, you know, from the safety of our homes and the comfort of our homes, we're able to find ways to stay cognitively stimulated and engaged. And we're gonna talk about some of the ways that we can participate in a variety of activities today. We're gonna give you some tips and strategies um, on doing that. Many of us feel that trying different activities and, and new things can be a lot of fun. I know sometimes it's reaching outside of our comfort zone a little bit to try something new, but we often find how much fun it can be to engage in those new opportunities. And another great reason um, for incorporating activity into our daily lives is that 
it can appeal to a variety of our sensory modalities. So think about your five senses and all the activities that, um, that can appeal to the use of those different senses. And again, we're gonna give you some of those examples today. Uh, the possibilities are endless. We know that participation in activities can really overall contribute to a better sense of mental wellness and mental health. Um, it's been shown that by participating in activities, it can really improve our mood. And of course, in the current state in our world today, um, many of us are, are kind of experiencing that our moods are, we're feeling a little bit more stir crazy, a little bit more cooped up or understimulated. And we're looking for ways uh, to kind of, you know, uh, alleviate those feelings. We may be also looking for ways to reduce stress and, and putting activity into our day can often help to bring our attention away from things that are bothering us or causing us stress. And certainly um, it provides lots of opportunities for enjoyment in our in our day-to-day -day life. There are many benefits to the activity that we incorporate into our day-to-day -day lives. And some of these benefits include, you know, that, that ability to enhance our dignity and our self-esteem. Uh, it really helps when we can feel productive and useful and successful at an activity. Those are all basic human needs. And so when we can bring activity into our day, it helps to accomplish that, that boosting of our self-esteem. It also um, provides you know, that sense of pleasure and fulfillment um, in our day, feeling we've really achieved something or worked towards something that's important. It has that ability to structure time and you know, throughout the day to give some structure to that day. And, and we may be feeling a bit amiss right now with that um, in, in being isolated more in our homes. We might not be able to pursue the things that we've normally done in our day-to-day -day lives. So activity as part of that routine can structure the time in our life and, and normalize life, especially when things aren't feeling so normal right now. Um, many of us find comfort in the normal. So that may be a benefit as well. It can provide comfort, you know, when we are doing an activity that is calming. Um, activities can be grounding. They can provide that sense of familiarity and reassurance in, uh, in an uncertain world that, that we're all experiencing right now. And of course, it can provide attachment to things that are important and meaningful to us and things that we want to continue to pursue. Activity allows us to use and capitalize on our existing abilities, on our strengths, and maybe we even get to show off a talent or two in the process. So think about those skills and talents that you have and those abilities. Um, activity can really help to capitalize on that. And one thing that we hear a lot from caregivers and family members is that it allows them to do things with the person and, and also for the person at times. And that has a huge benefit for many people as well. It is really important to consider that when we are choosing activities, that the activities that work best to engage the person are the ones that are meaningful to them. And when we say meaningful, you know, we want to reiterate that they're meaningful to the unique person. So just because, you know, an activity is meaningful for one person does not mean that it's going to hold the same meaning for someone else. And so we really want to be respectful of that and choose things that do um, bring interest and meaning into their day-to-day -day life. We also want to recognize that meaningful activities are based on the person's individual abilities, their strengths and their talents, as I mentioned before. Meaningful activities also mean that the action, the activity, the task can be successful in the process. It's not always about the end product or the overall outcome. It can be enjoyable and successful in the doing, in the doing part of it. So I often think of a jigsaw puzzle 
you know, and, and lots of folks that I've talked to over the years, um, maybe at one point they've really enjoyed a jigsaw puzzle and their ultimate goal was to get that puzzle complete as soon as possible. Well, we may need to just relax our, you know, our, uh, the way we judge ourselves and how we hold ourselves accountable for doing things as things in the brain can continue to um, be affected or to progress. And, and maybe now we find more enjoyment in being able to engage and, and do a little bit of that puzzle each day. So it's not necessarily about getting to the final result, but enjoying it in the moment. I think that's really, really uh, important to recognize. We also know that meaningful activities are satisfying, they're enjoyable, and that they can fall into one of two categories. So they can be meaningful because it's an active activity, or it could also be a passive activity. And so you might be wondering what I mean by this. Um, I'm going to use an example to help illustrate this point. So I want you to think of a person that perhaps used to play a musical instrument. Let's say the trombone, and they played that musical instrument for many, many years. Well, perhaps now because of the changes in the brain that they're experiencing as a result of dementia, maybe they're having a hard time uh, remembering how to play. They're maybe not um, as, as adept at reading the music anymore. But instead of just bypassing that activity of music completely, it may be more helpful to introduce putting on some of that music that the person may enjoy. And, you know, really um, putting emphasis on the pleasure that listening to music can be. So it can be active, but it can also be passive and still be meaningful and enjoyable. And I think this is a great segue into um, what we're going to talk about next, which is, is, you know, how do we, how do we adapt activities um, to meet the changing needs of the person that's living with dementia? So you know, we, we all know that living with dementia can certainly bring about a lot of change. And that just happens. That's part of that, that dementia journey. But it is so crucial to realize, to understand and recognize that a person living with dementia doesn't have to give up the activities that they've always enjoyed doing. Just because things are changing in the brain, it does not mean that they have to give up um, those activities that they find meaningful, enjoyable, um, and stimulating. Lots of the activities, you know, that we're going to talk about today and that maybe you're trying at home, they can be modified to meet or to coincide with the person's changing abilities. And, and hopefully they can continue to be modified over time as needed. So consider that, you know, how can an activity be modified as things continue to change along the journey? You know, in the early stages of, of dementia, it's, it's not unusual to see a person with, that's living with dementia, um, it's not unusual to see them withdraw from the activities that, that they may have previously enjoyed. You know, it's, it's not unusual to see that kind of pulling back that with what we often refer to as withdrawal, but I assure you that it's extremely important to help that person to remain engaged. And a big part of, you know, staying engaged means that the person's brain is going to be stimulated and active and, and hopefully as healthy as possible for as long as possible. So that's really, really key. And that's what all of the research is telling us is that keeping that person involved um, really does help um, to, to try to maintain that brain health. And when adapting activities, you know, it, it's important to have an open discussion with the person that's living with dementia around any concerns that they have about the activity because even slight adjustments to the way that you adapt that activity can make all the difference. So perhaps they, they have some concerns about, you know, why they don't want to do that activity anymore, but you could suggest some other ways of doing it that can make all the difference in the world. So it's good to keep those open and honest discussions going. When adapting activities to meet the current needs of the person with dementia, here are some key points to consider and to keep in mind. So, 
you know, keeping the person's skills and abilities uh, at the forefront when you're planning activities. You know, it, it may be best to, uh, to stick with the activities that the person has always enjoyed and then adjust as needed so that we can match um, the activity to the to the person's current abilities. So it's nice to try new activities, but depending on um, how the disease is impacting their brain, sometimes introducing brand new activities may be more difficult for them um, to kind of remember and to try to uh, to accomplish. So it's great if you can build on the skills and abilities that that are existing right now. We also want to pay very special attention to what the person enjoys. And, you know, we learn a lot from a person's body language. So body language can tell you how the person is feeling and responding to that activity. You know, we can tell if the person is feeling happy or content or comforted by an activity, but we can also note from their body language when they're feeling anxious or Maybe they're feeling overwhelmed or overstimulated. And we need to try to um, make sure that we're incorporating activities that bring more of that happiness and contentment. So what the person enjoys is really key. We need to consider if the person uh, begins activities without direction. So you know, this comes from observation and, and maybe, you know, considering the person and watching, do they normally set the table before each meal? Is that something that they really find a lot of purpose and enjoyment in? Um, do they, you know, is, do they enjoy the, the chore of sweeping uh, the floor or doing up the morning dishes? Because those are the kinds of things that you can plan um, those activities as part of their regular routine. So you make that part of that regular routine if already they're gravitating towards completing those types of things. We also need to be aware of any physical changes that the person is experiencing. So it could be physical problems, it could be changes or difficulties, um, and it could be their perceptual abilities as well. So Maybe they're having a hard time seeing. Maybe they're having a hard time hearing or performing simple movements. And we may need to adapt the activity to allow for that. So Shelby's gonna talk a little bit after about some of those activities, um, you know, using the computer, for example, to maybe zoom in to make a larger font, right? If they're wanting to work on a puzzle. Um, but being able to modify to meet the current needs of that person, it's, it's truly important. When adapting activities, we also need to focus on what I mentioned before, on the enjoyment in the moment and not necessarily that achievement of, or that end product. So activities that build on those skills and abilities you know, that enjoyment can be found in the process, not just in the end result or the achievement. Um, so going back to that jigsaw puzzle that I mentioned, I'm sure you can think of lots of other activities too, where it's really about enjoying in the moment. It's helpful if we encourage the person to be involved in, in their daily life, you know, and, and I want you to think about activities that make the person feel like a valued part of, of the household every day, valued part of that household routine. So it could be setting the table, for example, that makes them feel, you know, that they've accomplished something, that they've been successful at something. So involving um, that, that, those daily life activities and skills. It may also be about relating their activity to their work life, their previous work life. So I want you to think of a couple of different examples here. So a former office worker that probably thrived on having an organized space, an organized work life, they might really enjoy activities that um, kind of feed into that need to be organized. So it could be sorting coins, putting those coins in a holder. It could be helping to assemble a Christmas mailing list, a Christmas card mailing list, or Perhaps it's 
um, creating a to-do list of, of things that you want to get done around the home or a list for groceries the next time that you head out to the grocery store. Um, so a person that has that organizational background may really enjoy those kinds of activities. I want you to think about another example. So a former gardener or a farmer um, who has spent a great deal of time outdoors may still really enjoy the opportunity that working in the garden or working in the yard might bring. So relating that activity to their work life can be extremely beneficial. Looking for favorite rituals and routines. You know, this, this is extremely important. When you think about a person who has always started their day, uh, maybe breakfast, they get up in the morning, and after breakfast, they take a cup of coffee and the newspaper to their favorite easy chair, their favorite recliner, and they settle down with the newspaper to read it. Maybe that's how they start their day. And, and you know, a person that has a routine like that may still enjoy uh, participating in that routine, even if they can't understand or read every single word in the newspaper, they can still enjoy going about that ritual. That's key to consider. Considering the best time of day for that activity, um, caregivers and family members may uh, find that they have a lot more success with certain activities at specific times of the day. So people with dementia usually, I say usually, um, they usually perform best when they've had a really good rest or first thing in the morning, when they wake up feeling well rested. Their brain is ready to kind of tackle uh, the morning activities. And so maybe that's when they're feeling at, at their best to perform or complete that activity. It could be that the person with dementia may be experiencing some late day restlessness or what is often referred to as sundowning behavior. And at that time of day, maybe they're feeling a bit more anxious or agitated. If the care partner or a family member can introduce some activities at that time of day, it may help to take their mind off the anxiety that they're feeling and, and help them to stay engaged and, and more calm. And it can be soothing or comforting activities that, that you could introduce at this time of day. Adjusting the activities to the stages of the disease is something that we need to be prepared and flexible in doing. You know, as the disease continues to progress, um, it may be more helpful to introduce uh, some of the more repetitive tasks. And the reason we say that is, there is a tendency for um, that repetition or, or something that we call perseveration to come into play just due to some of the changes that are happening in the brain. And so, you know, finding repetitive activities can often provide that outlet for those particular tendencies. So it could be sweeping the floor, it could be folding towels or folding laundry, polishing shoes or silverware, um, even, you know, cleaning the windows, those repetitive tasks may help uh, with that. And of course, we need to um, make caregivers aware that we should be prepared uh, for the person to eventually take a less active role in doing those activities. And we're going to talk about kind of some of the challenges around that, around apathy and that lack of initiative that can sometimes be a barrier for people participating in activities. When we're considering activities to engage the person living with dementia, it, it really is key to consider what activities the person may be able to engage in independently, to enjoy independently, um, but also opportunities for them to enjoy activities with others. We always want to encourage the person to joy, to, you know, continue to enjoy activities on their own. It's important that they continue to do things for themselves uh, whenever possible. And, and of course, this can also allow the caregiver or the family member that's spending time with them it may give them a bit of an outlet to complete an activity on their own or to pursue a different interest or maybe to get a task done that they've really been working hard to get done. So, you know, when the person with dementia is working on that independently, it may give that caregiver a bit of a break. 
uh, it may be helpful to provide encouragement and reminders, you know, for that task if it's absolutely necessary. But we really need to allow the person with dementia to try that activity independently. You know, we want to make sure we give them that uh, independence and that that feeling of being successful and, and uh, productive. That's that's really key. It's also a really good idea to set up the activity to be as successful as possible. And, and you think about equipment or materials that you might use for that task. Well, it's great to put those in a place where the person can see it and reach it easily. You know, I think of, of the example of maybe getting help with some of uh, the dinner preparations, right? If you leave a potato or a couple of potatoes out with a potato peeler, maybe the person will pick it up and try using it. So using those cues to help with those activities can also be quite valuable. And, you know, while independent activities should be encouraged, don't forget to set aside time in the day when you can both focus on doing something enjoyable together, something that's mutually enjoyable um, and not necessarily part of the normal routines of the day. You know, set aside that time for you to share in that, that moment or that special activity that brings both of you meaning and enjoyment. Those are key thoughts to consider. While it is more challenging, you know, given the current circumstances around COVID-19, uh, enjoying activities with others is, is, it can definitely have its rewards. So, you know, we often say that what's good for, for people living with dementia is often very good for those uh, who spend time with them as well. And, and you can enjoy those, those interests together, as I was just mentioning. You know, if, if we help to maintain the interests of the person with dementia, often family members and other caregivers that are spending time with that person may be able to follow uh, those interests as well. So keeping occupied, keeping stimulated can improve the quality of life, not only for the person with dementia, but also those around them. So quality of life, especially during these challenging um, situations these days, you know, quality of life is something that we're really, we're really striving hard for. Sharing an activity, you know, can be mutually enjoyable and think of all the benefits that come from that. You know, it can offer that opportunity to have some great dialogues and great conversation, to storytell and reminisce, you know, about um, things that we did together. Maybe the, the topic of that particular activity brings about a uh, conversation about how you participated in that in the past. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that we build laughter and humor into those activities and to have fun together. You know, when you think about it, working together really brings feelings of teamwork, of sometimes compromise, um, of that, that feeling of togetherness and, and fun and the success of being able to achieve something or work at something together. So enjoying activities with others is, is extremely beneficial. So there may come a time when the person that's living with dementia may look to others for some assistance with activities. And so these are some, what we hope are, are very helpful tips and considerations to, to keep in mind when providing assistance to the person. So, you know, it may be that the care partner is, um, is needed to help get that activity started. And we recognize that most individuals that are living with dementia, they, they still have that energy and desire to do things. But due to changes in the brain, they may have a bit of apathy or what we often refer to as that lack of initiation or, or initiative to get started at that activity. Um, maybe they have a hard time organizing, planning, sequencing that, that, um, that task and that can interfere with their, you know, ability to successfully complete it. So, you know, when apathy makes it difficult, when that lack of initiative makes it difficult, 
cueing, you know, some prompting, some gentle guidance, some extra encouragement, um, that goes a very long way in helping to get that person started on the activity to initiate that task. So consider just some of that cueing and, and ways to get them focused and, and started. Uh, offering support and, and supervision. You know, you may need to uh, to show how the person or to show the person how to perform that particular task or activity. Um, maybe give some easy to follow step-by-step -step instructions. If you demonstrate how to do it, often the person with dementia will try to copy those actions and then um, they can become really successful at being able to complete it. Again, concentrating on the process and not the end result. You know, think about it. Does it really matter in the grand scheme of things if the towels are not folded the way that you would like them to be? You know, I know you, many of you are thinking that right now. We, we have a certain standard by which we like to do things, but does it really matter in the, in the long run? Does it really matter that we get that jigsaw puzzle perfectly complete? It's really much more about spending that time together, about keeping um, the person engaged, about them feeling as though they're contributing or being successful at doing something, they're feeling useful. And, and of course, safety comes first. So as long as the person is safe, we don't have to worry if they're doing the activity exactly right. You know, we don't have to make sure they're doing it exactly the way that we would have done. We need to exercise patience and flexibility and understanding. You know, if a, if a person is very clearly sending the message that they don't want to engage in that activity, um, it could be because they don't know how to do it. Maybe they can't get their, their body working to respond uh, to that request. Maybe they're experiencing fear from that, that uh, task. You know, we don't always know the reason behind it, but we never want to force it because the person will feel um, overwhelmed. They will feel overwhelmed if we continue to force the issue. And you know what, if, if the person wants to try doing that activity a different way, let it happen. Don't try to stop them and, and redirect them to the way that you would do it. Let it happen. And then you can always go back and change it later if absolutely necessary. You can always go back and change it at another time. Breaking activities down into manageable pieces, that is a great way to provide assistance. So, you know, focusing on one task at a time or one part of that task, um, because too many directions all at once can be very overwhelming and the person may give up before they ever got any enjoyment out of doing it. So if you can explain the activity step by step and just realize that it's more about enjoying the time that you're sharing together rather than getting to that ultimate goal. Assist with the difficult parts of the task. So, you know, you, you always want to allow the person the independence to try to do those things. But if you notice that it's a trickier part of that, of that uh, activity or task, then maybe you want to step in and, and try to offer your assistance. So let's take the example of cooking. Maybe you're cooking together, but you notice that the person is really struggling with trying to measure out the ingredients. Well, you take on the responsibility of measuring those ingredients and then maybe direct the person to, to stir um, whatever it is, whatever lovely concoction that you're, you're making. You know, you know, could you stir that for me and I'll finish measuring out the ingredients. Um, or it, it can be really helpful to say something like, you know, that, that part looks really tricky. Do you mind if I step in and help you with that? What can I do to make that a little bit easier? So providing assistance, but also um, um, looking to the person to ask, is it okay that I step in and help out with that part of the activity? When providing assistance with tasks, we also need to let the individual know that he or she is needed and that they're important um, in completing that task or activity. 
So, you know, saying to the person, could you help me with this particular aspect of, of the activity? Um, and if they do, you know, returning to them with, you know, thanks so much for helping me out with that. It was really, really helpful um, because that gives them that encouragement um, that, that really kind of solidifies that rapport with, with the individual. Make the connection, and, and this is really key to consider. You know, let's take the example of if you ask that person to make a card, make a greeting card for somebody. Well, they may not respond or they may not respond enthusiastically to doing that activity. But if you make the connection and say, I really want to get your help making a, a, a special get well card for our friends, you know, who could really need some cheering up right now and ask the person to join along with you, they probably will. They'll probably enjoy working on that task with you because they know the connection of making that card and that it could help to brighten someone's day. So that could be a, a great way of initiating that task. Please don't criticize or correct the person. I know as human beings, we, we have a very strong tendency to wanna do the activity the right way all the time or my way. Sometimes we think it's my way is the correct way. Um, but don't criticize, don't correct. Let the person, you know, play that activity out. And, you know, we don't wanna damage the rapport that, that we have created with that individual. Involve the person through conversations. So, you know, while you're doing those activities, whether it's folding laundry, whether it's preparing a meal or washing the car together or doing some gardening, you know, talk to the person about what you're doing. Um, we often see changes in communication that affect the person's ability to understand everything that you might be saying. However, I guarantee you that they're going to feel uh, included in that conversation, it's going to have a lot of benefits to having that dialogue. Um, so the person can still benefit from, from um, having that give and take of information, even if they don't understand all of it or respond to it. And keep that in mind as well. If we're starting to see a behavior present, it can be helpful to substitute an activity for a behavior. So I'm going to give you um, a couple of examples here. So maybe we're finding that the person with dementia is, is rubbing their hands on the table, you know, and we're watching them do that in a very repetitive way. Well, instead of asking them to stop, you may give them a cleaning cloth and encourage the person to wipe the table down, right? So they're feeling productive, but you're also kind of alleviating that behavior a little bit by giving them something productive um, and successful to do. If they're moving their feet around a lot on the floor, they're shaking their foot, put on some music, see if they'll tap their foot along to the beat of the music. Now they're enjoying it, right? They're enjoying that activity because it's something um, meaningful and something that they really enjoy doing, especially if music is a part um, of their everyday, day-to-day uh, -day enjoyment. And we often say, you know, I know sometimes it gets overwhelming if we're feeling that the activity isn't helping or it's not going anywhere, but don't give up on it. You know, try again later. If, if something isn't working, it could be the wrong time of day to tackle that activity. Um, maybe the activity is a bit complicated and we need to modify it. Don't give up, try it at a better time, try to do it in a different way and see if that helps, if that makes the activity uh, a bit easier for the person to enjoy. Okay, so I'm now gonna turn it over to our lovely Shelby to talk with you about some of the types of, of activities. Thanks Sarah, can everyone hear me okay? Good, thumbs up, okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so for the time we have left here, we're going to uh, consider some activities that we can do at home and look at some specific examples. So keep in mind, um, we've tried to come up with a, a good variety of activities here, um, but not all of them may appeal to you. So um, these examples aren't meant to be prescriptive in any way that you have to try all of them. Um, an activity that is appealing to you uh, may not be as appealing to someone else that's 
in this session. So the key here is to find an activity that works best for you. Uh, we also need to keep in mind when choosing these activities, um, and Sarah just alluded to this when she said try again another time, is that an activity that works one day may not work another day. So um, make sure that we uh, kind of build a toolbox of different things that might work and then we might figure out when the best time would be to use that. Um, so be prepared and adjust as needed and remember that flexibility and adaptability are key. Um, so let's take a look at some of the different activities that we can consider. So first we can consider um, any activities that can be done with items around the house. Um, so this might be related to food preparation. Some examples could be um, peeling potatoes, uh, baking a cake or cookies, um, stirring lemonade, making iced tea. We could consider pulling out some old recipe books. Um, maybe there's a, a family recipe that was popular, you know, mom's famous chocolate chip cookies or something that we could um, try making again and sharing that with family or neighbors. Uh, we could consider upcoming birthdays or celebrations or as Sarah mentioned, maybe a, a get well card um, that you could make on your own. So given uh, the circumstances with COVID-19, it might be a bit more difficult to make a special outing for a card. So we could get creative and, and make something like that with supplies that we have at home. Uh, you could also use supplies at home like calendars or uh, cereal boxes to make your own puzzle. Uh, and you can adapt this in a way that works best for you in terms of the size of the pieces, how complicated the design is. Um, so that could be something that you could have fun with. Uh, you could also, uh, this is the link to the All About Me booklet, which is a resource that some of you may be familiar with. Um, it is a resource for people living with dementia and by filling it out, it is a way to tell family, friends and healthcare providers um, about yourself, including your needs, likes and dislikes. So uh, it's, it's a great resource to go through. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned, everything is basically an activity uh, when you think about it. But when we look at um, some of the activities on this list, um, these might be some things that we're already doing around the house. And we actually may look at them and think, oh, those look like chores to me. Um, but we have to recognize that these activities can be beneficial and meaningful and provide purpose to someone, um, especially if they enjoy doing them. So people living with dementia may enjoy the simple, repetitive nature of these activities. Um, these household activities can also create the consistent routine um, that is very important to them. So if this is the case, uh, be sure to encourage and support um, any household activities that they're already doing, or maybe consider introducing um, one of the examples here. Uh, what's important here is that you make the time um, for these activities and then and then take your time. So rushing yourself or rushing um, the person living with dementia can make the activity less enjoyable and less appealing to do again. Um, so make sure that again taking that time and, and not focusing as much on the, the outcome or the end product. So reminiscing, um, there are a lot of great activities that can be done with reminiscing. Uh, reminiscing is a great way to draw upon and talk about happy memories of the past that can bring about positive feelings. Um, so reminiscing gives a person living with dementia an opportunity to talk um, and share meaningful stories, especially if maybe they aren't um, particularly used to contributing the conversation or maybe have difficulty doing so, these activities can really help draw them into the conversation. So choose reminiscing activities or topics that are linked to interest, hobbies, and positive memories. Um, so activities here around music can be great, whether you're, you're using catchy tunes that they will likely remember or that are um, aligned with a, a life event that they had. Uh, you could play Guess That Song. Um, it's really, really uh, connected. Music is really connected to, to emotions and past experiences. So even just playing a song and, and seeing what comes up can be a great activity. 
Uh, photos are also a, a great activity for reminiscing. So photos of family, friends, um, important life events are great choices. Um, photos of things that remind someone of, of their um, favorite hobbies. Uh, so if you go to like Shoppers Drug Mart or something, you might see gardening magazines or food magazines. So if someone really enjoyed gardening, um, they might love looking through a magazine of, of different flowers um, or a magazine of different foods or recipes. And there are a lot of great pictures in those and maybe less words. So that might be a, a, a great thing to pick up if you're out. Um, also, you could look at making a family tree. There's a lot of options for doing that online these days, or you can um, get out the, the pen and paper and kind of make your own family tree with, well, maybe looking at some old uh, family photos and making those connections. So you can also uh, brainstorm some different topics to just reminisce about in conversation. Um, so some examples here might be uh, talking about a favorite meal from childhood. So you could ask, uh, what did they like about it? What were the ingredients? Um, talking about a first job, you know, what was your role? Um, did you like it or not? How much did you get paid back then? You know, those types of things. Um, important memories, so what do you remember about a wedding day, the birth of a first child, um, memorable birthdays or anniversaries. Uh, looking back at school days, who is your favorite teacher and why? What was your favorite subject? And if someone liked to travel a lot, you could ask about travel experiences, like their favorite place to travel, where they went, who they visited, things like that. Um, and this, this activity can also be a, a great activity to suggest to a family member. So if you are, are keeping connected with a relative who maybe isn't coming to visit, but they're, they're calling or having video chats, you could suggest some of these topics to them um, as a conversation point that they could have over the phone with the person living with dementia. So Sarah touched on this in terms of uh, considering any activities that um, engage our senses of touch, hearing, seeing, smelling, and tasting. Um, these activities also do have a, a really good reminiscing quality to them. If any of you have been to chapters and smelled the candles there, I'm sure it takes you back to, you know, the pumpkin spice of Thanksgiving and, and all the different spices or smells, sorry, of, of each holiday season. Um, other things to consider here would be uh, activities related to smell with things around your house. So it could be easy to guess things like lemons, strawberries, or vanilla. Um, you could use herbs or spices that you already have at the house and, and try to guess that. Um, watch out for smelling the hot ones though. That, uh, watch out for that. Um, you could give hand massages with uh, favorite lotions or creams and especially ones that have a great scent to them. Um, like lavender. Uh, simple bird feeders can be uh, made at home. So if you have things like a uh, toilet paper roll, peanut butter, and um, simple bird seed or any seed or Cheerios, you can roll the toilet paper roll in peanut butter, roll it in the bird seed, uh, punch a hole in it and hang it up and see which birds and, and likely squirrels um, come to visit. Uh, you can also do things like with Play-Doh. So Play-Doh is a great activity for uh, that kind of tactile touch, but also great for fine motor skills. And if you're doing video calls with uh, your grandchildren, this might be a, a great activity to do over a video call if you both have Play-Doh and you're kind of creating things and, and showing each other and, and having fun with that. And then baking, All, I think almost every sensory activity or sense, sense comes in when, when we bake in terms of the touch, smell, taste and, and everything. So brain stimulation activities are really activities that get us thinking. Um, so it's important to always consider uh, kind of the time of day when we're doing some of these activities. Um, some of these activities may be better suited for when we are feeling at our best um, and more focused and more rested than maybe when we're feeling um, tired. So keeping that in mind. We also want to find activities that are stimulating 
but not frustrating. So in looking on this list, there's you know, crosswords, word searches, Sudoku puzzles, and trivia. But if we're looking for those activities, we can probably find all of them in a, a beginner, in, intermediate, or kind of advanced versions of them. So finding the one that suits, suits us best or the person living with dementia best is, is great. Um, there's also uh, books and podcasts. You know, if you have a, an audiobook or an ebook that you have, haven't been able to read, you could maybe look at doing that. Um, podcasts have also become quite popular. And you can actually find podcasts on almost any topic. So if, if you are interested in, um, you know, gardening or old sports cars or something, you can probably find a podcast where you can um, learn more about that. So general fun and games. So some of these we've seen before already talked about. Oh, but again, keeping in mind that not everything on here will appeal to you. So for example, I would take a word search over a crossword puzzle any day. Um, some of you might be the opposite. So picking something here that um, would really appeal to you and your interests. A lot of these activities can also be found on the internet. And what can be helpful with that, with that is that we can find ones that are easy to adapt in terms of the font size, maybe the level of di difficulty, or we can even um, link them to a specific interest. So if someone wants to do a crossword puzzle or a word search and um, they're interested in sports, we might be able to find ones that are um, specific to that. In terms of board games, you could see what board games you already have around the house. Um, either try playing that game or maybe even considering modifying the rules to simplify things. So an example of this might be um, if you have Scrabble around the house and you haven't played it in a while, you might set it up on a table and just kind of play it throughout the day. As you pass by, you make a play. Um, maybe you're not keeping score, you're just kind of creating the words on the board. You might not even use the board. You might just use the tiles to kind of create words together um, as a way to keep our, our brains active. Uh, in terms of riddles and jokes, um, it's really important for laughter, as Sarah mentioned. So maybe you might try um, having a joke of the day that you look up and, and share with each other. And jigsaw puzzles, that's another great uh, example of something that you might not do in, in one sitting, but you might set it up, um, you know, in the living room and just kind of chip away at it throughout the day uh, when you feel like doing that. And getting creative. So due to social distancing, it may be harder um, to get out and safely buy, you know, craft supplies and, and other items um, for some activities. So we might have to be more, more creative. Um, so look around your home and see what uh, supplies you already have available. So for example, uh, you can actually make like safe, non-toxic edible paints and Play-Dohs um, from ingredients that you might already have at home or maybe ones that you can get at the grocery store, but it doesn't take that extra you know, trip to Michael's or something like that. Um, what is important here is to have fun and focus on the process and not um, the outcome. So consider uh, maybe if there are any of these activities that you did uh, before when you were younger, um, maybe it's something that you might want to revisit um, or also looking at some of these and applying some of the modifications or adaptations that Sarah mentioned earlier might make that activity um, match or align with the, the current abilities of the person living with dementia. So technology. Technology has become very important for us during COVID um, as a means of staying connected. Um, so many things that we may normally have done uh, before in person may not be uh, available anymore. But fortunately, we can research some of these activities and see whether they are available to do online. Um, so examples might be some virtual tours of museums, parks, um, aquariums, gardens, things like that. So uh, consider seeing what virtual tours are available because there, there are a lot of 
what is available online. And Netflix. Um, Netflix was popular before. I think it's even more popular now. Um, there are a lot of great things on Netflix. So you can look at some of the new releases that are available every month or ask a friend what they're watching or recommend. Um, so some examples might be um, nature documentaries like Planet Earth. Um, if you're a David Letterman fan, he has a show called My Next Guest with David Letterman. There's trivia on there. So if you like Jeopardy, um, the whole Jeopardy show is on there. Uh, there's also a lot of um, baking shows, uh, the big family cooking showdown, also do it yourself and reno shows like Storage Hunter and Fixer Upper, and also classic movies and sitcoms. So like Gone with the Wind and the Andy Griffith show are all available on there. Uh, so continuing on, Zoom activities have become quite popular, so that's how we're able to meet today. Um, YouTube is also, you can find uh, almost anything related to a personal interest on YouTube. So for example, if the person living with dementia is interested in um, a specific athlete or had, you know, like the 1967 Toronto Maple Leafs, I think that's when they won the cup last, um, they could look up, you could look up highlights for that on YouTube and show them things like that. Or, you know, if they are interested in history and, and certain things about history, you could look those up. So YouTube is a great resource for finding very specific things to the person's interests. We also want to consider activities that address um, our mental and spiritual wellness, especially um, during these times, it can be quite important. So we can look into beginning a meditation practice. It can be as short as, you know, uh, five minutes, even one minute. Um, a lot of them are available online and can kind of teach you what, what that is about. But the breathing exercises that are at the core of many meditations um, can help us feel grounded and reduce feelings of stress and anxiety. Uh, you could try journaling. So journaling is really about creative expression. So this could be in the form of doodles, um, just writing down some bullet points, poems, sentences, whatever appeals to you. And journaling can be therapeutic. So a way for us to get our thoughts or feelings on paper um, and somewhere for us to express them instead of carrying them around with us. And uh, looking at um, daily gratitude and, and ways of recognizing and expressing this. So not only can um, expressing our gratitude be grounding, but sharing it with someone else can also um, help bring up feelings of harmony and connectedness. Now this isn't always easy during difficult times and can take some practice. So sometimes people will keep um, a gratitude journal where they jot down things from the day and kind of reflect on what they're grateful for. Um, I had a professor in university who, who used to say, look for the highlights in your day. So he said, pretend that you're going through your day with a yellow highlighter and you're highlighting the most positive parts of that day. Um, he said, you might be surprised to see that it, it might be some of the simple things like the blue jay that came to the bird feeder or the virtual hug from a, a grandchild that might be some of the highlights in your day. But those can be some tools that can help you practice that skill. So physical activity is beneficial to our physical, mental, and emotional health. Um, so we can look at um, of exercise routines that we, we might want to do at home that don't require a lot of machinery. Our Minds in Motion program is a great example of this. If you, if you want an existing program that um, is a lot of fun, I think most of you have met Jen at some point um, and doesn't require a lot of extra machinery and also has a social element to it. Um, you could go for a walk. So for many, getting outside while maintaining social distancing can be a key to recharging your emotional batteries and feeling grounded. Um, a peaceful neighborhood walk or run is a great way to take charge of your mental or physical well-being. Um, and if you feel comfortable and can maintain that um, social distancing, you could in invite a friend and keep your distance and, and catch up in that way. 
uh, learning a new yoga pose. So again, instead of trying to take on a whole yoga routine, break it down into manageable steps. So maybe try one thing a day. And if you enjoy music and dance, then uh, turn on some music in your living room and, and either dance by yourself or with someone else um, to uh, the music of your choosing. And environmental activities. So some of you may have already started some spring cleaning, um, but I am not sure if you know, but decluttering uh, physical things is actually uh, very um, helpful in terms of reducing stress. So when we have less physical things around us, it actually um, helps with our, with our mental and emotional health or health. Um, so you could consider cleaning out or organizing closets or the kitchen cupboards or going outside and, and doing things in the garden. Um, a, a tip here is to, again, start small and, and chip away at things. So make sure that um, the task that you're going to tackle is manageable in the amount of time that you have. I'm sure many of us have had the experience of maybe um, trying to do uh, some sort of cleaning and then running out of time and either leaving half a mess or throwing everything back into the closet and maybe it, it looks worse than when it started. So chip away, um, make it in small manageable steps that maybe you can tackle um, over, over a couple of weeks or something. And then lastly, um, consider activities that focus on your hobbies, or keep you safely connected with others. Um, so you could uh, get creative and have an at-home spa day where you could pamper yourself with do-it-yourself masks, a foot bath, a manicure, pedicure, having a video chat party. Um, so you could grab your favorite beverage, um, snuggle up on the couch and enjoy a face-to-face -face conversation with a friend or loved one. I know a lot of people are doing um, trivia over video chats where they kind of create their own questions and then they ask their, their friends and have a bit of a trivia night. Um, and then find creative ways to stay connected. It could be over the phone, video messages, email or text, distance visits, or um, fun porch drop-offs of like a card or some baked goods. And then trying to keep, keep connected with your hobbies and interests. I know that um, COVID could have had uh, an impact on maybe engaging in some of your hobbies or interests, but um, try to stay informed about what new activities are available as regulations change. So for example, um, people are able to, to golf now with some changes um, to, to how that's done. Um, there are also a lot of businesses who have gotten creative in how they offer their service so that people can still um, come and see what they have to offer. So for example, the Indian River Reptile Zoo um, has a drive-through dinosaur exhibit that a lot of people have been taking advantage of. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the Toronto Zoo now has a drive-through option as well. So I'm trying to stay informed in terms of what, what activities may be out there um, and adapted for both the COVID times and it might make for a good outing. And I think that's all we have. Thank you, Shelby. Yeah, we've just posted up some of the resources that we've used in uh, in putting today's presentation together, if that information is helpful to you. Um, and of course, if there's if there's anything at all, you know, if you're looking for resources, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because we can always email those resources, uh, little toolkits and things to you. Um, there's a wealth of information um, through the internet right now, but also um, we can help you with some of the resources that we currently have at the Society. And um, so I just, I know we're a little bit over our time, um, but I just wanted to open it up to the group now to see if we have any questions at all. Um, so please, please feel free to ask your questions. I'm just going to stop sharing so that I can see all your, all your lovely faces. But um, hopefully the information, the tips and strategies were helpful. Do you have any questions at all? Feel free to unmute yourself. I think yeah, David. David. Yeah. Um, yes, you mentioned podcasts 
Um, tell me what they are and how you access them. <laughs> <laughs> David, I myself might need some help with this from Sarah. Uh, well, but, like uh, <laughs> my understanding of a pod is like peas. Uh, oh. I used to call them with my mum. <laughs> okay. So uh, podcasts are basically like um, online programs. I would think they'd be comparable to online radio programs. Um, that you can sit and listen to on specific topics. So um, there are different apps that you can download where you can search for podcasts. So I know a popular one is Spotify. Um, Sarah, are you familiar with other options for downloading podcasts? I, I know, I know I hear a lot of um, folks that are, I think like our boss, for example, she's always talking about podcasts that she's listening. I think even through like the CBC radio channels and things, there's podcasts on a variety of different topics. So um, I imagine it involves, you know, that you can, they're, they're quite searchable on the internet. Um yeah, so I don't know. Is any anyone else um, familiar with podcasts that have any suggestions that they can make and share with the group? What's the difference between a podcast and uh, YouTube, for example? Um, podcasts are usually uh, you sit and listen to them, whereas YouTube you would is kind of a, a website where you can search a lot of different videos. Okay. Um, so, for example. Um, my, my husband is a big hockey fan, so he often listens to a podcast about hockey and each, each week they might have like a different player on or like the general manager for a team. And it's usually about, uh, I'd say maybe 45 minutes to an hour long. So they might listen to an interview with that player or kind of find out what happens behind the scenes when they're not playing hockey. Um, so that's a, an example specific to hockey, but um, I, yeah, I would, I would compare it more to like a, a radio program that you can put on maybe while you're making dinner and listen to or just kind of listen to while you have tea, um, whereas YouTube, you're often searching for videos. So uh, what, what video plays uh, or can you, can you get a podcast on the radio? Um, usually it's through like a computer or an iPad or something that you can listen to or, or through your phone. Um, but yeah, we could, we could send you an email, David, with some examples of a podcast that you could, you could then pull it up and listen to and, and see. Okay. Um, and then some examples of, if you like it, some different like apps that you can use um, if you wanted to be able to search for podcasts on basically anything right okay well i'd appreciate that yeah no problem great idea yeah thank you david great question any any other questions or or comments oh mike showing some are those lilacs mike oh those look lovely <laughs> so there's a perfect uh, activity to get out and <laughs> outside and enjoy you know, cutting some lilacs and putting some fresh flowers in your home to, to give us all that kind of cheery, uplifting effect that we all uh, probably need right now. Oh, look at that. Mike, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. Tell us what you've got there. There you go. Yeah, these are from a friend that I had in New Zealand years ago. And I find things like this kind of helpful just because it's almost like having somebody with you, you know. It's, mm -hmm. So that, that's, uh, those are from uh, Cook Islands, Rarotonga. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, uh, and there's some other ones. Oh, you've got quite the collection. Oh, yes. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's wonderful. Well, things like that, that, uh, you know, friends have given you and so on, and that remind you of places and so on, I find really, I don't know, just uh, fulfilling. They sort of 
they don't have a purpose and so on. Well, and it's a great way to uh, elicit some storytelling and reminiscing too, right? I think that's that's wonderful. Thank yeah. you for sharing that with us. Any others, any other comments or, or questions that we have from today's session? Um, it was really packed with a lot of information and we certainly, uh, we certainly understand and we had a lot to talk about today. Um, if you're looking for any you know, resources, please don't hesitate to reach out to Shelby or myself. You can email us. Um, we'd be happy to send you anything that might be helpful for your unique situation. Um, I just wanted to let you know next week, so next Tuesday, uh, for those of you that heard Anne-Marie Peters uh, do the session on grief and COVID-19, she's going to be back next Tuesday talking about advanced care planning. So if that topic is of interest to you, planning ahead, planning for the future, um, sometimes, you know, given the situation we're going through right now, that's going through people's minds and, and they're considering that. So. Um, so if you can make it next week at 10 o'clock, we'd love to uh, to have you on on the program again. What was the topic? Advanced care planning. So talking about planning for the future, powers of attorney, substitute decision makers, and, and information like that that may be very helpful. Yeah. Shelby, I want to thank you so much for, for co-presenting today and do you have any last words or any last things that you want to share with the group? Uh, well, just thank you. This is my first time presenting in this role since being on a year off on maternity leave. So um, it's, it's a great way to kind of dip my toes in. And so thank you for being a great audience and having great questions. And again, if you have any um, questions for Sarah and I about the presentation or even want a copy of it, um, feel free to email us um, and we'll be happy to follow up with you. Thank you, Shelby. You did an awesome job. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, again, we're going to continue to post our sessions on our website and on YouTube. So if you know somebody that couldn't be here or would maybe benefit from listening to the topic today, please don't hesitate to direct them to our YouTube page or to our website. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all again in the future. Uh, wishing you a lovely day. Stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, looking forward to the opportunity to see you all again. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.